Hi, Christine Fraser. How are you? Hey, Ali. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We are so excited to have you on the Women in Golf feature that we're doing. And um, you've got such a unique position. And this is what's so fun about this series is that there are so many different types of women in different roles in the golf world. So um, I actually found you just um, through a friend um, that works over at Palos Verdes uh, Country Club. And I think he's was just like, this girl was on the Challengers. It's such a cool <laughs> spotlight. And what she's doing is so unique. So I can't wait to, you know, get to know you better and hear a little bit more. And for everybody else to just, you know, landscape architecture to now golf course architect. And that's just an incredible story. So great. Yeah, excited to get into it. it. But awesome. <laughs> So we always start off with why golf? Like, how did you get here? Why this sport? Can you tell us a little well, bit about that? Yeah, I have a, a pretty kind of um, cool and very privileged foray into golf through my mother. Her parents, mm -hmm. my grandparents, actually bought a piece of agricultural land in the 70s and turned a cornfield into a golf course. And, <laughs> and that business has been in the family ever since. So I, I spent every single summer since yeah. I was very young out on a golf course. So it's just kind of, you know, that's my sort of safe place where I feel like home the most. So. And you were so totally born into it. And that was Canada, right? Yeah, just outside of Toronto. Yeah. And that's where you're back home now, correct? Uh, other side of Toronto, well, but yes, back in Canada. Okay, back in Canada. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And I think, um, you know, from the standpoint of growing up into it, you obviously played the sport and played in college, right? I did. Yeah, I went down to Florida and played golf down there at a D1 school. So just kind of just been, you know, really such a part of my my journey. Yeah, and your DNA for sure. Mm. So and then you tell us what you studied because you were really focused in on landscape architecture. But it was it from going into that you knew I want to be a golf car course architect. Yeah, so I had, after um, I had finished, I wrapped up my college career, I wasn't good enough to keep playing golf, mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I wanted to stay in the industry in some capacity, and got, because of my grandfather having designed and built a golf course, you know, I always thought it was, you know, a viable career pursuit, so, yeah. so that's yeah. what I what I decided I wanted to do. And so there are a few different ways to get into golf architecture, but mm -hmm. the route that I chose was kind of the academic one. So I got my yeah. master's degree in landscape architecture and I kind of put landscape architecture together with my competitive golfing experience. And it just, it was really just a, a great pairing. That's so neat. I'd love that. And not everybody has that trajectory and path where college is what they, you know, go to school for or what they do after school. So it's neat that you've really stayed on this path that you're obviously very passionate about. What about, um, and this is interesting because obviously it's a very male dominated world. Um, I think two questions, one tied to like college, how many other women were in those courses with you as you started to get into more of the golf, you know, oriented classes? Um, well, it was general, it was a general landscape architecture okay. program. So mm -hmm. it was a pretty equal split. Yep. Um, but after, you know, when I really got into the golf focus of it, and when I, and mm -hmm. when I then went over to the UK to work within golf, it was extremely rare to come across another woman within, you know, these kind of decision making right. rooms at golf courses, right. on the board and the committees on the management. Um, it was it was quite rare. Right, right. And if you do you feel like you've seen a shift just from out of college to where you are now? I I have. Um, I really have. And I think that's thanks to social media being a great resource mm -hmm. for me and um, being able to connect with other women in the industry, not necessarily golf architecture, but, you know, superintendents, journalists, yeah. clothing companies, just, you know, yeah. because women have this bias and discrimination that we mm -hmm. face, we, you know, we we have to kind of make it our, you know, make our own way through that. Right. And we do that by opening up our own companies and networking mm -hmm. with each other. So social yeah. media has been a, a great resource for me in that way. I, I feel that too. And that's just starting this business and totally new to the golf world on my end, other than casually loving the sport. Um, 
I'm fascinated by the outreach and the, I think, warm welcome from other women just in the space. Like, it's so cool. Um, yeah. Even with I, this, we're... right? Like, I reached out to you in very, very left field, but like, it is just fun that we're all sharing kind of the same platform to talk about it and such a great sport and be a bigger part of it. So That's I feel it. That like the, ne the necessity to collaborate amongst ourselves is, yeah. you know, creating some really exciting content and it pushing is. the golf industry as a whole to, you know, modernize and kind of catch up with society. Yeah. Yeah. I feel it. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, so what about in your profession, aside from being a female, like what differentiates you, you know, in the, in this space? I think we can kind of play off that the previous question is because we've mm -hmm. kind of faced this, this amount of rejection that women often do in male dominated industries, we, mm -hmm. you know, we have to persevere through that and, and that yeah. kind of process comes with its own perspective and comes yeah. with its own unique experiences that, that other people don't necessarily have. And mm -hmm. So, you know, anyone who's in kind of a marginalized experience has that ability to bring a new perspective. Yeah. Um, and it's just finding people who who value that and who believe in that and don't think that diversity is, you know, too risky to explore. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a big topic for sure. And it's, again, the platform, everything um, going on right now, I think it's opened up um, a lot more opportunity for change, which is really cool. So mm -hmm. um, just to get into a little bit more of what you do and how you do it, uh, what's your favorite type or style of course to play well, or design? I'm assuming they're both one and the same. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, I so when I when after I graduated from my master's degree, mm -hmm. I was offered a job over in England um, and that's when I really got into links golf traditional yeah. kind of old school golf and and that style of golf and that kind of community oriented golf really mm -hmm. resonated with me and so I, I think links is probably what i really like to play and also yeah. if i were to have the opportunity to design a link style mm -hmm. course i would i would really enjoy that you don't get them very much in north america just right. because you have to have the right you know soil complex mm -hmm. and right location mm -hmm. to do that yeah, but well, that's so neat. And I think, I don't know that many people understand the difference in golf in the US and the difference in golf, um, let's say in the UK. Can you speak yeah. to that a little bit? Because I think it's really, I think it's really interesting. And it's um, a little bit of, not barriers to entry, but barriers to play the sport here because of that difference. Yeah, and I think a good way to kind of um, speak to that differentiation is golf in North America, Western ideals of golf, um, kind of see golf as a business, mm -hmm. um, as a way to capitalize on certain expenditures, whereas golf in the United Kingdom in particular is more of a service to the community. Mm -hmm. It's a community asset where members of the, of the community can use it, not only for golf, for walking their dog, for getting physical exercise, even without being a golfer. So there's mm -hmm. this kind of crossover between the golfing community and the rest of the community that's really succinct right. in the United Kingdom that doesn't really translate in North America for I don't know, whatever reason. Yeah, it's fascinating. You don't hear about that at all. But I, you know, I think, yeah, yeah it's, it'll be interesting. And I, it's, we'll get into this because I want to hear a little bit more about um, like a few things that you characterize your, I mean, your work around. And I think it has a lot to do with um, changing the way that golf is um, played, the way golf is, um, again, more accessible. So I think what's really neat and it'd be fun to hear is you talk about um, accessible architecture. So can you talk to that a little bit and tell us what that means to you? Yeah, um, it's just essentially break using architecture as the tool to break down barriers mm -hmm. to entry. And a, sort of a kind of a tangible example of that is um, making sure that 
the sort of the ADA standards of design, mm -hmm. which are you know, standardized in buildings are kind of applied to a golf course so that you can have people with mobility issues mm -hmm. with visual impairments also play golf and also cool. have an enjoyable experience and feel considered. Cool. Um, so just adapting, you know, using traditional, I'm not revolutionizing golf architecture sure. in any way, but it's just using those traditional design philosophies mm -hmm. and applying them with a different perspective for a different group of people to make it more inclusive. That's really neat. That's really neat. And I feel like you don't hear about that a lot, but we also, um, and it probably depends what you're searching on your Instagram and TikTok of what populates your feed. But I know this is like, um, you know, new to me and especially from the golf course design perspective, I know there's so much that goes into it. Um, one other thing that I thought was interesting, and this is from watching your challengers feature, and you talked about brown turf. What is that? Yeah. Yeah. So very, um, if I can keep this brief, there's <laughs> this concept of, there's this concept of Augusta syndrome mm -hmm. and it came, came about with the original broadcast of Augusta in color on national TV for the first time back in the 50s and um people from across the world saw this broadcast and said why doesn't my golf course look like that yeah. and it just developed into the standard of expectation for yeah. golf of like lush green grass with high rough blue ponds birds chirping flowers in bloom <laughs> right? you know, this idyllic vision of mm -hmm. golf and and what people don't understand is the amount of resources and consumption mm. and energy that goes into achieving that look. Yeah. And so, um, you know, grass, turf and grass has a natural life cycle. If you look at your lawn, it's not always green, right? No matter where you are in the world, it has this kind of period of dormancy and of, of brownness yep. that it goes through seasonally. And, you know, that's the true nature of grass. Mm -hmm. And so if, Golf is always fighting with that yeah. because of this Augusta syndrome. Brown grass means it's unkempt. It's yeah. you know less good mm -hmm. than a green horse, which is you know really untrue. But it's just this kind of idea that consumers have come into. Right. So just trying to like come away from that. Yeah. And now that we we like to think about our water consumption, mm -hmm. so. The, the way that you have green grass all year round is you water oh, all the time. Right, right. And um, so you... if we're thinking about keeping golf inclusive and affordable yeah. and accessible, yep. that water consumption cost is eventually passed down to the consumer. Absolutely, absolutely. And do you, have you come across any courses that are really open to this idea of kind of building a course around those um, sustainable concerns? Yeah, it's pretty standard in the, in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, they have the infrastructure in place to allow golf courses to brown out. And mm -hmm. when, when they become brown, they generally become firm. Yep. And, and that creates a different type of golf than we're used to in North America, yes. like the firm and fast golf that you may hear people talk about when they talk about open venues yeah. or Lynx golf. Yeah, how neat. That's fascinating. Well, hopefully it will, you know, translate and move this way. <laughs> yeah, I would a, love that. That's such a neat thing. Um, what about, so you talked about forward tees and keeping that in mind. <laughs> um, how does that come into play with your design and your thought process around a course? Yeah, I mean, t golf course architecture has traditionally had a certain clientele that mm -hmm. architects try to create golf courses yeah. for. and the people who play the forward tees are generally not at the forefront of that. And yep. that's women, beginners, seniors, people with inj injuries, people with disabilities. Yeah. So yeah. it's basically just considering the experience of those players. And, you know, we don't want the forward tee pushed off to the side next to a tree over a water, right. no grass growing on it, which is so often the case. Yeah, yeah definitely. No, no, that's neat. And that's good to be mindful of. It's funny because my husband and I were talking about that yesterday and um, 
he was like, no, I mean, he really should be on the, the back tees. But he's like, anytime I've tried to play a forward tee, he's like, I just, I am wildly out of sync with where I should be and all that. And he said, even as a younger player too, that that was, um, he think that there was just spoke to that. There was so much room for improvement on how the forward tees totally. are played and all that. So, yeah. And if we think about how creating an equitable experience mm-hmm. for all golfers, yeah, you know, you don't want to play off a, a terribly maintained forward tee. It doesn't right. create a nice experience for you. So, right. And I know it was, um, a couple weeks ago that I got to talk to, um, a lady from that's director of first tee for the Chicago area. And she said um, they're working on changing a few courses in Chicago that are um, much more generous and playable for a younger player. So um, I thought that was interesting and I think speaks to a lot of that forward T philosophy and everything. So it's, I know, a consideration for stop, which is neat. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to take it from a business perspective, if you can encourage people to start playing golf sooner and yes. play longer into their senior years, so, you know, that's a good business model. Absolutely. An important spot to be for sure. So yeah. um, this is a little bit of all, off of golf, but obviously since you're an athlete, um, is there any other sport you wish you could master? Oh, uh, um, <laughs> I'd love to be good at pickleball because I feel like that's another <laughs> sport where you can yeah. just like play forever. Yes. So yeah. I, yeah. You're at least a second or third um, lady that has said the same thing. So I haven't even attempted yeah. it yet, but it's, I know it's hot right now. So it's um, super hot. an yeah. interesting one. <laughs> um, what about um, a little deeper, but who do you look up to the most? I know you've had some incredible mentorships in your um career but also you've got this family that's obviously helped you you know get to where you are so do you have somebody that you really look up to yeah that's a great question I think I can I'd love to like highlight Mm -hmm. um some of the other women golf architects who have sort of come before me because people don't often you know that we forget about them yes we don't know that they even exist so to highlight someone like Alice Dye or Marion mm-hmm. Holland, who has such impact over one of the most incredible courses that we've all heard of, Augusta, Pasatiempo, Cypress yes. Point. I mean, women have had their hand in these golf clubs yeah. and these yes. golf courses, and and we overlook them. So, um, I'm I'm so grateful for for those women to have really done the work, and yeah, you know, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today without without them. That's so neat. That's very true. Very true. Yeah, and it is incredible to look at some of those names and um, the courses they're tied to. It's in- really incredible. It is. What about <clears throat> um, just a funny one, but it's always interesting to hear. Are you a superstitious person? I'm really not at all. <laughs> no. And go- I know how golfers can be. And, right. you know, we a little bit OCD in a lot of ways, but that's not me. No crazy superstition. <laughs> mm What about outside of golf, outside of work, like what are some of your hobbies and what do you, what do you do to really relax and kind of unplug? Oh, I love like a a nice little weekend away somewhere in a new city that I haven't been before and just, you know, walking around without a map and getting lost and stumbling across a coffee shop or a cocktail bar and kind of just that experience of being in a new place that's unfamiliar trying new things, right. trying new food, finding a good wine bar. That's, <laughs> that that's really, really nice. exciting to me. Yeah. And that kind of excitement is often rejuvenating as well. It is. And refreshing to really like unplug and get out of your typical world to some degree. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, I think about golf, you know, like a lot. <laughs> yeah, <you do. laughs> so my free time is generally like far, far away from all of that anything golf related it's it's so funny because when i got into this business i've had so many people be like oh my gosh you're so lucky you'll be able to play golf all the time you'll be around it like i don't know when i'm gonna have time to play golf at this point (laughs) so it'll be interesting to see if this totally wears me out and i'm the same way um yeah i know my husband and i typically we've got a bunch of kids so it's like (laughs) such a peaceful retreat for us to go somewhere and actually golf so Mm. We'll hang on to that until I get 
you know, maybe burnt out from this. I don't know. But so far, I just haven't played. So it's still high on my list. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about um, another just casual one? But are you binge watching anything right now? Oh, um... you had a long flight to Sweden. So what were you doing on the flight? Were you watching? I reading? watched Babylon on the flight. Oh, all right. But I also watched um, Swarm is the new TV show. Billie Eilish made a little cameo oh, in it. Oh, cool. Um, it's about the kind of fandom that the music industry creates. And oh, interesting. it was very, very weird and very um, disturbing. I bet. But I really enjoyed it. And um, <laughs> all right. I, uh, I recently <laughs> went to a the Taylor Swift concert. You are not um, the only. I love people's reaction to that because they're like, "Should I admit this or not?" I'm Could like, you... so my partner is like, you know, it consistently Wild. within the top one percent of listeners <laughs> on Spotify every year. So big fan. So we That's did so that, funny. and um, where was that it concert? Ca- it was in in Dallas, Texas. Okay, cool. So we had a great time, but there's a, there's a, it was also reminiscent of this sw- of swarm yes. that I had just watched. So there's you know, that's too funny. I had um I've seen Taylor Swift, and I remember it was like right out of college for me, and Kelly Pickler opened for her, and yeah. even out of college, I felt like I was almost the like oldest person there, like aside from <laughs> parents taking their kids. But she's such a good performer. Yeah, I mean, I can't knock, no. knock the show. It was extremely entertaining, I and bet. she was on stage for three hours nonstop. So. You're kidding! I would love to see her again. Yeah. I've heard nothing but good things. That's so fun. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> it was certainly fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's see. What about? Um, have you been to any PGA events, and do you have a favorite? Yeah, I uh, was fortunate enough to, when I was working with Martin Hotry over mm-hmm. in the UK. He had been a consulting architect for the RNA, so he has wow. consulted on all of the open venues yes. um, and got an invitation to the open every year. And so Neat. I went to Carnoustie and Birkdale and Hoylake and St. Andrews twice, St. Andrews oh. last year. It was um, so cool. it, that kind of one of those like very spiritual pilgrimages yeah. back to the home of golf that um, was extremely special. and. Um, that kind of feeling that energy that you pick up with these things is is you know, you'll always remember that absolutely oh that's wonderful that's that's a good one to have at the top of your list and quite um the locations you've been to that's so neat I, san, yeah san andrews is definitely high on my list i've got a lot of scottish heritage so um i know one day i'll get over yeah, there. yeah please go there yeah <laughs> and you don't even, and like i said like we were talking about earlier like you don't even have to play the old course to get the full experience yeah like, yeah, it looks go like on. It. You can go on Sunday and walk the course and just be amongst other people who feel that reverence for something in golf. And it just, you know, the I, pubs are involved and it's just really special. It seems like such a wildly different experience um, in, really terms is, of, yeah. in terms <laughs> of a course that is so highly, you know, acclimated and valued and for it to be so open. And I, th- I like you said, it really speaks to the way everything works over there versus here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and so we cool. recently, um, we have a, we have a dog now. Oh um, yeah. Were you able to so I've been take him over? Calling around to like find golf courses that yeah. allow dogs on the course. And I'm always like, I'm always talked to like, I'm crazy. Like, <laughs> of That's course we do not allow dogs oh, on a wow. golf course. And so the, um, huh. I like, the the Sunday before the Open Championship, there's dogs ripping around the first and 18th hole at St. Andrews. You know, like, <laughs> why can't we? Like, really, what is the reason That's that we can't so... have dogs on our golf courses? Right. That's so cool. You let me know when you find one because that I know that would be find. great. I know. I know my dog would love it. All right. Thank um. You. Let's see. So. This is a little bit more about your style and you've got a, I mean, you really do have a good sense of style. And I loved like what you were wearing in your, the challengers video and, but you have your own <laughs> sense of style and you can feel it. Um, what is like off the course? What's your, how would you describe your style? Um, I really, I really enjoy fashion. I mm-hmm. like trying new things. I like being thought of as weird and, um, <laughs> Something and of your I own. Think, like, yeah, and and I think that 
that you know I really have to be brave enough to bring that to yeah. golf as well and, yeah. and come as my authentic self and right because I'm encouraging other people to do that so yeah. my style is a bit like maybe a bit too modern for golf I don't know how you would mm -hmm. say it but it's like it's Doc Martens I have tattoos I have piercings yeah. like it's not usual yeah um and I really kind of enjoy pushing the boundaries of golf and sometimes <laughs> yeah. you know I'm in a position where I can you do that um right. and encourage other people to do that yeah. so i find that exciting that's neat um, i think that's cool yeah you, I, you bring your own style to the to the game and, and i think and more I'm, people are doing yeah. that i agree and i think that it's really exciting how you know, i've never really related to traditional golf fashion yeah. yep it's not inspiring to me yeah so i i love to see this kind of resurgence of golf finally catching up with you know the way that society has appreciated streetwear or Absolutely. you know this kind of reversion back to you know when women were pushing the barrier and wearing pants like just kind of yeah. pushing pushing the pushing the edge of, of right. what you know is fashion and what is appropriate on the golf course yeah there's a lot of movement in there and i think that's been that's what's so fun even when i launched the pga show going to a show like that and seeing really all the different brands and I feel like they're yeah. popping up everywhere and but everybody has a different take on it which I think is so important and I know you walk into a pro shop and somebody will always tell you that women's is it's hard to buy we're hard to buy yeah. for um but I also think it's getting harder for a pro shop to meet like what their ladies like and you've got the traditional golfer and maybe a generation of like I will always have a collared shirt on. I will always wear a skirt or, yeah. you know, those pieces that you think of like default as golf clothing. And right. then I think you've got the, these other women, whether they're younger or not, but I, um, I think they're just asking for more. So totally. And it's, it, it is, it's fun that it's breaking down that a little bit and bringing something fresh. It's really and, exciting you know, because it, yeah. it really is kind of contributing to that shift in golf culture yeah it is and, and that shift has to be holistic it has to be you know yeah. every kind of aspect of the industry coming together yes, and this is where we need to move yeah a hundred percent it's really cool that's awesome what about um all right a fun one do you have a hidden talent <laughs> <laughs> no i make sure everyone knows my talent <laughs> nothing yeah. hidden i know if somebody asked me that i'd be like no i don't nothing i actually don't spectacular <laughs> no. <laughs> i wish i did i can juggle a ball in my club like i don't know 20 oh times. well that's impressive i think for those of us that cannot do it that <laughs> looks impressive um what about a time that you felt most nervous is there an event either in your career or personal life that you felt most nervous yeah i um i think it, it's been recently actually I've, mm -hmm. I've recently tendered for my first solo job um so as you know the role That's of right. lead architect for a full long-range master plan for a very established respectful was, historic was, golf club that is the is it the toronto hunt club is that the one the toronto hunt yeah yes. yeah exactly and um so i really have had this kind of like gone through this process of coming into myself and finding mm -hmm. confidence and finding kind of power in my voice because yeah. of this platform and the decision right. they made to bring me on. And so I, I, for something like that, it made me very nervous because yeah. also I want, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of the brand. So yeah, I can't, it's hard for me to separate, you know, who I am as a person mm -hmm. with who I am as an architect and, not take rejection personally <laughs> yeah so that, that kind of makes that makes me nervous it does and i i mean it certainly strengthened strengthened you but it is a nerve-wracking thing right to be told no or yeah. you're not the right fit or anything like that and that's definitely finding your place and believing in yourself yeah. obviously you have to exactly. stay true to what you're providing as a service and expertise and yeah it's not for everybody i'm sure so mm -hmm. congratulations yeah. that's that's huge thank you it is huge it's really special oh it's wonderful and what does that project look like is that 
all this year? Is it the next two years? What does that look like? Yeah, so we've kind of like come the way it generally works is we've kind of decided that we're going to be in a long-term relationship. And <laughs> so we're going right now, we're going through the, we, we've done the sort of this discovery phase of mm -hmm. how we can improve the golf course, what the golf course needs to modernize and evolve and yeah. be ready for the next 10, 15 years. And now we're in the That's design so phase of how that translates into design and practical yeah. um, ways of designing, changing the golf course. Um, so if that, if that goes through the membership and everyone's mm -hmm. on board, then, then, you know, the, the fun part starts for me where I get to put my steel toed shoes on <laughs> and get in the dirt. I love that. And, and start to build it. So it's years long That's process. Well. Yeah. Um, so as, as you're saying, you know, it has to be a, a good fit and right. you have to have the same values when you get into a kind of relationship with golf clubs because yes. generally they're long-term. Right. So I was going to ask you, but you answered it. What, what's your favorite part of like a master plan like that? And it sounds like getting your hands dirty as they're like, I love it. Yeah. I, yeah, that for sure. And there's also this other aspect to it of like just meeting people and, and I'm, I'm, I just thrive on intimacy and connection yeah. and, um, creating a space where people can be vulnerable and express themselves and so meeting the members and That's asking really them what they like and what they don't like about yeah. a specific hole or golf course is, is actually really fun for me as well. And I'm sure it, I mean, it goes a long way with those members and the people that generally might not be quite as involved or have a voice so that's really yeah cool. yeah that's absolutely. really cool what about um let's see what what deep down motivates you mm. okay we're getting we're in deep are we yeah i know <laughs> yeah um, i think i think golf has this incredible opportunity to like change people's lives mm -hmm. for the better and and give people the tools they need to improve their life and to improve their relationships. And, mm -hmm. and so that, you know, that truly does motivate me of giving people an opportunity to evolve. And, yeah. and I, and I think golf can do that. Yeah. Right. That's such a good point. There's a, a lot for the sport to offer. And unfortunately yes. I think a decent amount of the population that either hasn't experienced or it, experienced it or, you know, known enough about it of, you know, how to get out there, where to play, yeah. how to do it. I have, I have a lot of female friends that don't play and always mm -hmm. think it's, um, they use the word intimidating. And, um, you yeah, know, I think it's fun to be like, just go out. You don't have to do anything well. Like just to be outside and mingle and drive around in the cart and hit a few balls. <laughs> like it is such a fun release yeah. and good way to connect yeah, and with I people. Totally agree. And I can, I, I can relate to, you know, the intimidation factor because yeah. walking into, you know, a space that you're uncomfortable in where yeah. you don't know the rules, where there yeah. are unwritten rules, there's yes. like a language barrier within yeah. golf. Yeah, there is. It, it's, it's intimidating. It is. It is. Well, here's to the evolution of it. <laughs> what about, um, okay, we got like two <clears throat> more questions. So one okay. is, um, what's the best advice you've ever been given or is there a piece of advice that you pass down to other women yeah i think don't be afraid to be the only woman in the room because yeah. we're in an industry where that's you know very plausible and it's yeah. going to happen and mm -hmm. you're going to have to believe in your own voice and yeah. and trust that you know there's value in it and and not be afraid to speak up yeah love that that's a good one and then lastly what's next for you obviously you're in the middle of you know, the master plan for um, the Toronto yes. Golf Club. And is there anything else, any other small little opportunities or things that have come to you as you have obviously had a bit more exposure and what you're doing? Like what's on the horizon for you? Yeah, I mean, the Challenger series has really opened up a lot of doors for me. Um, I'm going to play in their Pro-Am in May oh, um, at Colonial. Awesome. So that's super exciting. Yes. I have to, you know, hit the, I'm going to have to hit the range before yeah, you I are. embarrass myself. <laughs> you won't. But, um, cool. yeah, it's really cool. And I've, I've just been enjoying, like, receiving emails from strangers and making connections and discovering, you know, how cool golf can actually be through social media. So it, it everything feels super optimistic and positive momentum. That's so fun. It's nice that things like that really just spur more conversation and opportunity. And I mean, part of it's the networking, but it's just 
again, the platforms and the channels that we have today to just be out there and meet other women is so fun. That's I hands down the most energizing part for me is that um, just at every turn there's um, somebody new with a different talent, a different interest, a different perspective. Um, obviously, you were one of those women, and it's so cool to have just kind of heard a little bit more about what you're up to in a, in a world that not a lot of us really see. So. Like yeah, thank well, you thank enough you for, your, for your thoughtful questions. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, that was so fun. We're gonna keep in touch, and I can't wait to see what you're up to. If for some reason I land anywhere near Toronto, <laughs> I might hit you up. For Please a tour. do. I love it. Well, Absolutely. enjoy enjoy your trip to Sweden, and hopefully you get away and get to unplug, find that wine bar. Yes, don't worry. We we found it. <laughs> I bet you did. That's awesome, Christine. Thank you again.